Welcome to Indianomics. I'm Lata Venkatesh, and my guest today is the renowned Dr. Nouriel Rubini. Dr. Rubini needs no introduction. His prescient calls about the global financial crisis of 2008 and the more recent property crash in China are just two instances that come to the mind. But in his latest book, Mega Threats, he points to 10 threats starting from geopolitics and climate change and wars to soaring public and private debt and joblessness due to the rise of artificial intelligence that can lead to the world in the very least to a depression like in the 1930s. Well, today we have the man himself uh, to learn from and to hear about these mega threats. Dr. Rubini, thank you very much for joining us, sir. Before we get uh, to the book itself, uh, let me start with what is immediately panning out in the United States. Do you think the banking collapse is over for now or was that just a trailer and we may see more of that kind? Uh, I don't think it's over. I think there'll be more financial institutions are going to be in trouble. And recently, the problems of the banks have come from what is referred to as market or duration risk, meaning having long-term securities whose value is falling as interest rates are going higher. But we're going to go from market risk to credit risk because now there is a beginning of a credit crunch in the banking system, especially the regional banks that lend money to households, to corporations, to businesses, to commercial real estate. And once there's going to be a recession, then there'll be more non-performing loans, more defaults by households and businesses, and therefore there'll be more stresses for parts of the U.S. banking system. Mm. But you feel pretty sure it is going to be hard landing and recession? Uh, after all, the latest jobs data uh, is indicating that unemployment is not high. Uh, the numbers are still not rising. So you think we may be able to escape without a recession at all? Well, paradoxically, the fact that the labor market is still tight, the low unemployment rate, aging of population, restriction to migration, fall in labor force participation rate, implies that the wage inflation is still too high. And therefore, the Fed has to increase interest rates even more to achieve the 2% inflation target. But if they raise interest rates even more, there will be two problems. One, the likelihood of a recession becomes more likely and a severe recession. Two, they will have more financial stresses, not just for banks, but for other holders of assets. And also for those who have too much debt, going to face debt servicing difficulties. And there'll be a doom loop between the economic contraction and financial stresses. So there is a contradiction between the achievement of price stability on one side, maintaining economic growth and having financial stability. Mm. And the recent stresses in the banks makes this trade-off even more hard to achieve. But what if they wimp out? What if they just learn to live with a 4% inflation? Uh, would that still mean a stagflation? Or would it mean, well, you know, some kind of growth, uh, not very good, but, uh, uh, you know, we still amble along. Is not that a possibility? I think that the Fed, like most major central banks, will wimp out, going to blink, because the consequences of going back to 2% inflation will be economic and financial instability. In the short run, that may prevent a recession. In the short run, the stock market may rally. But if you blink, then there'll be a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectation. There'll be a more severe wage price spiral, and we'll have a repeat of what happened in the 1970s when the Fed was behind the curve, inflation got out of control, and then we still had stagflation because of negative supply shocks. And you can postpone a debt crisis maybe by a couple of years by wiping the real value of nominal long-duration debt with unexpected inflation. But once inflation expectation moved upwards, then long rates are going to be higher, short rates are going to be higher, nominal and real are going to be higher, and therefore those who have high debt ratio are going to still face eventually insolvency. So you're going to postpone the stagflation and the debt crisis, but you're not going to be able to avoid it over time. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. You uh, argue that very clearly in your latest project syndicate uh, essay. 
and to uh, in the medium term in the mega threats book but before i come to that uh, uh, dr rubini what would you advise investors then as you point out uh, in your project syndicate article the 60 40 debt equity didn't work at all in uh, 2022 investors lot lost on both counts is there a place to hide now uh, there are options um, absolutely 60 40 works only when inflation is low and therefore the correlation between equity and bond prices is negative but when inflation is rising even more gradually you get uh, that equity do poorly so the discount factor for equity long rates is higher but long rates being higher means the price of bonds is lower and therefore you lose money even on unquote the safe defensive asset is bonds what you need to do to protect yourself from inflation are several things one is a short term safe bonds that reprice higher with higher yields without the price impact of long duration inflation index bonds gold and other precious metal that do well when there is inflation the basement of fiat currency but also when there is de-dollarization in the world and also you want to go in some of the green metals the green transition is going to imply more demand for the green metals but the supply is going to be limited by a variety of constraint finally sustainable forms of real estate may also be part of that portfolio you need the real asset that do well when inflation is moderately high and but you need to do real estate is going to be sustainable because many real estate assets even in north america are going to be stranded because of global climate change flood hurricanes sea level rises heat waves and droughts you name it mm. so you have to think about alternatives to traditional 60 40 Oh yes uh, I think people are already listening to that advice we are seeing the way gold has been trending higher uh, but uh, Dr Rubini what about emerging markets as an alternative uh, asset class uh, at least in India and I'm sure in several other emerging markets as well we are already into positive real rates uh, interest rate is higher than inflation would that be a, a, a worthwhile asset class Uh, it depends uh, you have to distinguish between the better credits in emerging markets and those that have high inflation twin fiscal and current account deficits and other forms of macroeconomic problem i would say that india among emerging market is a certainly a positive one uh, it has a high real rates as a reasonably stable now monetary policy fighting inflation fiscal policy could be better but is okay and the structural factors for india go in the favor of india potential growth around 7% maybe higher with more economic reform a young and growing population a catch up of per capita income because it's much lower than china so india is going to be a rising power in the next few years and that means with additional economic reform so certainly india and a few other emerging markets might be a good place to invest both for fixed income and even in the equity markets okay uh, uh, well that's good to hear at least uh, the viewership here who is listening to you right now uh, but uh, dr rubini you spoke about de-dollarization uh, that's been a real talking point especially after the sanctions against china you think that can work a non-dollar medium of uh, exchange between countries Well it's clear that the strategic rivals of the United States uh, China Russia Iran or Korea Pakistan and their own friends and allies want to build an alternative uh, economic monetary and global reserve currency system because they're concerned about the sanctions that the US Europe and other can impose you know the Chinese have a trillion dollar of dollar reserves and therefore they're going to move in the direction of proposing the rmb as being an alternative to the us dollar and gradually of course we are going to go from a unipolar to a bipolar global reserve currency system in that system however i see india being closer to the west and to the dollar rather than being close to the rmb you know china and india are strategic rivals uh, they have uh, border issues it's true that india right now may need uh, oil energy food fertilizers from russia uh, but that dependency can change over time and i see the future of india 
uh, geopolitically being member of the Quad, being closer to the U.S. and the West. And also, it's going to benefit from uh, French shoring. Money is going to be moving out of China because of the risk of China. It's going to move to places that are much more friendly to the West. One of them, given the industrial and tech base, is going to be India. So I assume that India is not going to be part of that the dollarization process. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess India would do anything to have a dollarized world rather than a yuanized world. There is no taking yeah. away from that. Uh, that's uh, our eggs are in that basket. No taking away from that. But uh, let me come to the book, uh, uh, Mega Threats, and the crises that you speak over there. Uh, the first of them, actually, let me start with this uh, uh, bipolar or multipolar world that we are heading into. The U.S.-U.S.S.R. divide could still work and we could have a protracted Cold War because they didn't have interlinkages. A Cold War between U.S. and China uh, doesn't look uh, even plausible because there are so many interlinkages. So do you think the two powers will amble on because there is so much that they are buying and selling to one another? Well, it's different, as you point out, compared to the Soviet Union. But unfortunately, geopolitics is going to be driving economic and trading partners. Uh, it's not as if we go from full globalization to full deglobalization. It's going to be a matter of degree. There will be some degree of deglobalization, of fragmentation of the global economy, of decoupling, of balkanization of global supply chains. After all, we used to care about free trade and about fair trade, now about secure trade. We used to uh, think about offshoring, and now we're thinking about reshoring and friendshoring. We used to have uh, just in time a global supply chain. Now we need uh, just in case, uh, redundant, in case there are geopolitical shocks. So the trend is towards a greater restriction to the trade in goods and services, in the movement of capital, labor, technology, data, and information. But that's going to be, as I said, benefiting those emerging markets that are actually friends of U.S., Europe, and the West. And I see India being one of the success stories of this process where you care more about friendshoring, secure trade, than just in case uh, global supply chains. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bini, one of the most interesting uh, theories I found both between your book and the Project Syndicate article is the fact that we are probably staring at a protracted global inflation for various reasons. Uh, I want that discussion in a minute after this very short break. <laughs> 